starting the conversation. Welcome to the SPSJ podcast. In today's episode, Luke and Grace are helping us to think about eco-theology from a biblical, theological and a practical perspective. Uh, it'd be interesting to, to maybe like what so what, what are we going to be looking at today in the podcast and why are you excited about it okay Let's that start sounds there. good <laughs> well you have done a brilliant interview and uh on environmental issues and i think eco theology is that a word we can use i think so yeah well, if not we can claim it so. excellent we'll use that and um just kind of how we can be better stewards of our environment i suppose mm. and um you've talked to your friend regina at Arosha, am I yeah. pronouncing that right? Yeah, Regina Abner. She's um, yeah, she's brilliant. She's a, uh, I absolutely love doing the interview. She's got so much enthusiasm and passion that it's so contagious. Um, so looking forward to be able to reflect a bit on what she says. Absolutely, um, she's a uh, really inspiring, but a bit intimidating. Maybe is that <laughs> fair to oh, say? Yeah. I hope <laughs> not in person. When you meet in the flesh, she's yeah, like, yeah. She draws you in, which is um, which is I think, I don't know. For me, this is one of the things I find kind of, kind of exciting about looking at the whole like environmental stuff is I just think so often that we hear so much about it and there's that sort of you're left with that lingering sense of like what can I do how can I respond what difference can I make and it can feel quite overwhelming um so yeah she has a talent of helping it feel a bit more playful and fun which um which I'm sure we'll be able to think about a bit more in the end so but like what so um before we sort of dive into listening to her interview like Grace what is it that, that kind of excites you about this topic and maybe it doesn't maybe you think it's a completely useless topic and we shouldn't be <laughs> talking about it um but what yeah what what's, what are you coming to this episode with in that sense well i am excited about it i don't i wouldn't be here if i wasn't <laughs> so uh, i think it's a really exciting really fascinating topic and mm. i think i come at it from two angles one is um academically i think because mm-hmm. i'm um uh i teach uh, environmental stewardship at a bible college and mm. Um, just all these ideas about how as Christians we're called to care for the environment and why and how it Mm. links into our own salvation and our own life as Christians is fascinating to me and just over the last few years um, my husband and family and I we've been trying to dig into that question of how can we be caring for our planet better how can we Mm. you know be part of this world without taking from it too much and trying to you know do the usual things like reducing our plastic waste and mm. trying to use the car less although we've now moved to the countryside and so that's harder to do mm. <laughs> i think we've maybe gone backwards in that but um we're just really aware of all the things that we could be doing and trying to make small steps in that mm. and so uh this interview was brilliant for giving more inspiration and we'll talk about that later but um how about you what's what interests you about this yeah i think I, one of the things which which really excites me about it is the the particular opportunity we have almost to respond as the church. I feel like this it's been on the agenda bubbling away for quite a long time and uh, and it's I feel like it's we're kind of reaching this point where churches are doing more in how they think about how we respond as communities as mm. well as individuals um so that really excites me I mean here in Hereford and at um, SPSJ I'm involved in um this sort of eco hub stuff we're doing and I feel like I'm not you know I'm definitely muddling through along with others as we try it um but you know, hear, hearing and just thinking and engaging about this, I think, helps us muddle through better. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, I just think sometimes we can sort of think, oh, there has to be someone else who, who knows what to do or who can do it better. Um, and so I think, yeah, for me, I'm excited to be able to think, what, you know, how can I continue to respond in ways which just don't feel overwhelming? Mm. Um, and, I, yeah, I've, I've been able to be involved in a, a number of different sort of eco projects over um the last few years and, and particularly one of the the things i most enjoyed um was being involved in helping leading this event called sustaining church which is sort of a, a conference for bringing together theologians and experts in other scientific fields with practitioners to think how do we do that um and so for me it's exciting to be able to sort of continue reflecting and thinking in this sort of setting um 
So, well, should we turn to, to listen to what uh, Regina uh, brings to us? Because uh, I'm sure there'll be loads we can chat about um, when we get back from that. Absolutely. Let's do it. Wonderful. So I'm so delighted to um, be here with uh, a good friend, Regina, who um, uh, works for uh, Russia UK. Um, so hi, hi. Reggie, welcome to um, welcome to our early first podcast series for SBSJ. Um, it's great to have you um, being willing to be involved in chat with us today. So yeah, um, thank you so much. Really good chatting. Yeah, do you, do you want to give us like a, a little bit of an intro to yourself and 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 who you are and what you do and where you're based? I mean, I, I met I met Regina through um, through basically the weirdest sort of intro story ever in that. Um, Quite early on in our relationship, I went to visit her to help build a straw bale house. So if I introduce you, that's all I'll talk about. So it'd be good to hear a bit more about you more generally, um, <laughs> just so people have a bit of, a, bit of an idea um, where you're coming from. Yeah, that was actually quite a fun first meeting. But <laughs> yeah. yes, I live in East Sussex at a Shvanen place, which is a Christian conference center and retreat center. And I'm part of the community here. I'm passionate about anything in connection with community, land, learning to live closer to the land. Um, and yeah, I work for Russia UK, I'm running one of their three programs or coordinating it. And yeah, what else can I tell you? <laughs> give, so, give, like, I, I, the, one of the reasons I love you, Reggie, is because you, you have like all sorts of really interesting projects and like things you're involved with. So can you give, give me like a highlight of a few of the things you're you're doing at the moment which you know I always love hearing about. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah so at the moment I've, I've got a few chickens which are really fun, um, yeah. two goats which uh, the lawnmowers for the churchyard there's in the <laughs> middle of Ashburnham place um, and I am yeah still involved in building a straw bale house which we started in 2020 in the first lockdown. Yeah. Um, which I actually quite enjoyed um, everything closing down. So we had a lot of time, people. And um, so we just went off with a group of people studying, learning, doing an online course, figuring out how you can actually build a building with natural materials only, and then went on and did it. And so we've got a tiny little house in the woods and just behind it, there's a hill, which um, we are at the moment uh, planting a food forest on. And so, yeah, that's also going quite well. Got lots of trees in and at the moment looking at um, planting shrubs and so lots of fruiting um, bushes, climbers, trees, um, rooting plants, herbaceous plants. And so creating this little ecosystem that is there to invite people in to experience nature, enjoy it, and hopefully soon walk around it and just eat. Honestly, and it is amazing. So if if you're ever down in the sort of Sussex direction, I would highly recommend um, visiting Ashburnham and wandering around. There's an amazing walled garden as well. But but yeah, if you go and go and visit, I my I'm biased towards the little straw bale house because you know some of those some of those straw bale blocks inside the wall. I place those and I trim them down, so I feel that connection with it. Um, but no, it's a, a amazing amazing place, and yeah, I. I I escaped there in my mind when you know when things were overwhelming here. So, um, no, that's wonderful. And, and then tell us a, a little bit more about um, a Russia UK and the area that you're that you oversee um, in that charity. Yes, yeah, so Russia UK is the only Christian conservation organization, actually. Mm. And um, so we are, there are three programs that our Russia runs. One of which is Eco Church, which I believe your church is part of. And yeah. so that's like an award scheme for churches to um, look at all of church life and try to be more sustainable, caring for nature in a very practical way, but also in um, lifestyle choices and worship, teaching. And so it's a really nice program where churches can sign up and then journey towards becoming um, more loving for nature, really, um, really caring mm -hmm. for creation in all elements of church life. And then another program is called Wild Christian, which is more for individuals or families. Um, and it's an online platform where you get inspirations um, about choices or, or lifestyle changes that you can make in your own home, in your own garden, with your family and your local community. 
And then I look after Partners in Action, which is um, a program where Arosha partners with different Christian organizations, landowners, land managers, and really looks at how we can practically make a difference on the land that we um, care for. And so we partner with, um, at the moment, 41 different organizations across the UK and overseas territories. So we've got a partner on St. Helena as well, which was quite a fun project to get started. So I had to spend a whole month on the island. Oh, sounds <laughs> awful. Sounds terrible. Very, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I almost stayed there, to be honest. I know, here I am, Lord, send me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so um, it's quite, it's also, yeah, a, a really good program with um, people, organizations that already have like their own main um, aim. So it can be conference centers, outdoor activity centers, two cathedrals. So very different partners, mm -hmm. but all of them love God and want to learn how to love nature more and love people whilst doing that. So bringing all the three elements together. And so we partner with them and then just help them on this journey which is good fun. It's amazing. And um, it's really worth just checking out the sort of a Russia website or Russia UK website to, to see all those different things and to sign up for Wild Christian, things like that. Um, uh, and yeah. yeah also, uh, if you live close to a partner, why not pop in and see what they yeah. do? Because yeah. they are really good places that do amazing work and can be really inspiring, I think. It is yeah, I was able to. Uh, so, so before the Straw Bell House, the first time I met Reggie was actually when I was um, involved with Hazelnut Community Farm in Bristol, um, which is one of Russia's partners in action. And and from the autumn, I'll be going to join Hillfield Friary, which is another partner in action. So, um, hopefully, oh, I'll really? get to um, get to see you more you regularly. But all our partners, are you? Yeah, I'm obviously working my way around. So, you know, give, give me give me time. I'll get around the, the whole the whole thing. But um, yeah, no, um, I, I mean, I'd love to hear because obviously you've mentioned there how um, different organizations and communities can respond, how churches can respond, how individuals can respond. Like, why, why, why does a Russia, why do you think um, our response to environmental matters is something that connects with our faith? Because I know some people um, sometimes sort of think like, oh, is this really what Christians should be banging on about? Aren't they supposed to be like, you know, focusing on, um, you know, saving souls and the gospel and things like that? But why do you think this is something that's really important for Christians to care about? Um, I think I'll, I'll share, share a bit of my personal journey with that um, yeah. with you, which is maybe not the most common um, Bible references, I suppose. But I think for me, um, I always loved nature, but just because I grew up in the countryside in Austria between mountains and lakes, and I think you can't help it but just enjoy it. And so um, but for a very long time, I didn't do it intentionally. And I also, um, yeah, for 10 years, moved around quite a bit, working with community development projects and do the kind of normal mission things, I suppose. And But one um, passage in the Bible, I know we shouldn't have favorite passages, so <laughs> <laughs> possibly, <we> all do. <laughs> say, but it was my favorite passage and still kind of is. And I guess it guided me in this time all the time was um, from Matthew, is it Matthew 22? Um, uh, where, yeah, Jesus is asked what the, the most important laws are, kind of a trick question. Mm. And then he says, um, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I think very often we kind of see that like, yes, we need to spend time with God, spend time in prayer, spend time um, in church, worship and study the Bible. And then uh, we go out and save the souls, right? Love the neighbor. And, but for me, um, it kind of took me a bit on a, on a journey for a while thinking, okay, but what does it really mean to love God? Because mm -hmm. if we really believe that he is the creator of all things and it is his gift to us, then if we love him, surely it means we need to love all of creation. And mm -hmm. so, for me that started to be a, a really exciting journey because i think if you really love somebody and they give you a gift you won't be just like oh thanks that's nice and then chuck it stamp in the on it <laughs> yeah and so i was like okay actually this is his gift and 
if you think of it that he's the creator of it um it's like an artist right an artist yeah. when, they, when they create a piece of art i'm not an artist so <laughs> can't speak from <laughs> experience much but i believe that they put their whole heart into it right if you're mm. a songwriter you you create songs that are from your heart or if you're a painter you create something expresses something that is within you and so for me god put all of him into creation and so when i am out there enjoying it i i can learn so much about his character just through being within it and so i really love and the more i actually spend time outside the more i fall in love with him because mm. i know that he made all these just beautiful plants like in spring everything coming back to life and it's mm. just a really exciting journey i think and then going on to loving your neighbor um loving my neighbor is not just yeah i need to make sure that all the people living around me um i don't know pray the prayer and you know save the souls kind of thing but it's more if i really love my neighbor who is my neighbor first of all i think mm. i like to ask that question because it's not just the people in ashburnham although I do love them most of the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's also people, I don't know, in the neighborhood as in close villages, but it's also the people that make my clothes. So I, it's people in, in Madagascar that are already struggling massively because of climate change. And mm. it's, my neighbors are all people on this planet, I believe. And so if I really want to love my neighbor, I need to think about all my choices and I need mm. to think about where, uh, how do I shop? What do I do? And make, I guess, life giving choices and not choices that um, damage someone else's life or, or make their life harder. And I also think that my neighbor is not just the people that are here now, but my neighbor are actually the next seven generations. And so if we really want to love people, actually, we need to live in a way that there's still a planet here for them, that they can yeah. still have healthy food, that they can have good air to breathe. And so caring for creation is, is also caring for people. You can't actually separate mm. the two. Mm. And if I want to love myself, well, it's not just going down the road and eating whatever I want in McDonald's or whatever actually I need to make good choices I need to eat things that are good for my body I need mm. to live in a way that it's good for me because um, if I really love myself surely I would want to live a lifestyle that keeps me healthy and so again the same thing for me being healthy for my mental health to stay happy mm. I actually do need to spend time outside I I wouldn't be happy if I was just in those four walls, although they are pretty walls. I painted <laughs> them. Um, but <laughs> I need to go outside. I need to be in the garden. And um, yeah, so I think lifestyle choices, actually, we need to include everything. You can't love yeah. one thing without caring for the other. Yeah. So, I think that's incredibly helpful, actually, to sort of root, um, to root this sort of whole conversation, this whole um you know, aspect of, of what it means to be a Christian, sort of out of these really quite core sort of Christian, you know, this core Christian calling that we have, because um, because it, it's not because that went the way you described that there. That's not sort of that this is something we can have tack on the edge just to be sort of relevant to you know to the cultural concerns of our day. It's actually this is kind of right at the heart of, mm -hmm. of of what it means to to be a Christian, to love God, to love neighbor. I find I, that's, that's really that's really helpful. And yeah, not not the verse I'd initially sort of expect someone to sort of um to, to respond with so no so thank you for that I was um yeah very very thought-provoking and I, I was particularly struck by um I mean what was coming to mind as you were speaking was in that final part when you were talking about um loving neighbor in particular was um Saint Fran uh, sorry not Saint Francis but um Pope Francis um and his sort of Laudati C stuff where he was sort of connecting the environmental issues with issues of justice and um, care for the poor and for the sort of those who are oppressed in various ways um, and just really connecting up again that sort of um, that love of neighbor with actually our care for creation as well yeah. um, uh, but I'm but I'm also kind of struck by um, in your, knowing you and hearing your introduction and hearing you speak um, it feels like community is also kind of part of your 
response and your way of, of, of living that out in so many of the ways you talk about. It's often about coming alongside others or drawing in with them. I mean, you live in a, you live in a community setting now. Do you, do you mind sharing a little bit about how you see sort of um, community playing a role in, in some of this, as well as our sort of personal responsibility for our lifestyle choices and consumer things? How does, yeah, how does communities um, play a yes. role? I've lived in community the last 20 years, probably. And I think, so for me, living in community and in connection with creation care, it's really about learning to um, create regenerative communities. And I think it's, it's doing things alone, first of all, can be quite lonely. Mm. I think often if if we really think about um, climate change facts, biodiversity laws, and you can get quite overwhelmed, I think, and sometimes like lost, like what can I do? I'm just yeah. wondering what difference can I make? But I think when you surround yourself with people and just talk with people, share and um, hear each other, it's. I think very often it's more about listening to others than talking, to be honest. I think God mm. made us ears and one mouth for a reason but it's for me it's really about um walking together with people because i might have some good ideas and some things are probably quite easy for me to do just because of maybe personality who i am mm. what i'm passionate about but others might be really good about at something else and so if you walk with people and learn together there's so much you can learn from each other mm. and i think also something that at the moment I'm not doing much of, but I would love to do more of, is um, try to connect generations more. Because I think in our society, very often it's quite separate. Mm. But actually, um, older people, they have a lot of experience. They have a lot of wisdom. They have possibly more time, way more patience than me, for sure. <laughs> so, there's there's a lot I can learn. And then younger people, they've got crazy ideas. They, they don't see limits. They are more creative still. And somehow in between, we've got a little bit of both and possibly mm. maybe it's easier to get finances in place. And so if you work with loads of different people from, um, you can achieve something much better, something much bigger. You can put resources together you can put ideas together and mm. energy and it's just so much more fun to do stuff and so I think as church community or I live in a community a residential community it's just so much nicer to walk with people than trying to struggle on your own and yeah. I think it also it's much more easy to actually do it with joy because even if you do something that maybe is not super nice to do, but if you do it with a few people, you can just have fun. Mm. And here, for example, we recycle all our own um, food waste, our um, cardboards, all the compostables, basically. But if you think about 80 people living together and guests coming in, often plastic and everything gets mixed in. So the team here, they have to actually sort through every bin. So they oh, have wow. And so that can be quite smelly. <laughs> not the most nice, the nicest job, you know, you can think of. But um, our uh, grounds, one of our grounds guys, he just always has a smile on his face, and they turn on music and they half dance doing it, and it's like it's the compost party. Like people want to be there because it's fun. And so <laughs> I think I that. In the community with people, you can just achieve way more, and you can actually encourage each other and help each other um yeah enjoy it and i, I love I think, that that's on my my list my to-do list for the next time i visit ash burnham is to join the compost party because that sounds great <laughs> and I, actually i i love hearing you talk like that because i think um you know one of the things i know i can sometimes feel is when we sort of think about climate stuff as an individual and then and we think through all these choices we need to make and the ways our life has an impact it can quickly it can become very overwhelming as you say and you can sort of feel the weight of all that responsibility and in that question of who is my neighbor we can almost feel responsible for you know ev everyone all the time which, which sort of feels like such a heavy load um and when you think through um some of the sort of mainstream movements responding to climate change there's often quite a quite a sort of a a downcast perspective a quite a, almost hopeless sort of um perspective yeah. on some of these issues and that sort of narrative of 
of joy and fun is um is something really quite quite refreshing within that um within both of those dynamics i think yeah um, For me, working with a, a organization where obviously I hear um, climate change facts all the time mm. and I hear about biodiversity loss and new data comes in all the time. And it, if you focus on that, I think it's quite depressing, actually. Um, yeah. I think for me, although I work with it, that's not actually my motivation. It has never been my motivation. I think it's really important to figure out what our motivation for change is. And I think um, it's important to know those facts because I, mm. I guess it helps us to see that it is urgent. We do need to change now. And if we haven't changed now yet, today is the day to make changes and mm. not wait for tomorrow. But I think the motivation for me still needs to be love because mm. if, if um, all those climate change facts um, get me, then I will do it out of fear, I guess. And very often mm. when we are really afraid of something, we'll just stick our head in the ground and not do anything because it's way too much. And we can think mm. of it too late. Or if we do it, like you said, um, feeling guilty about stuff that we do wrong, like mm. with whatever we buy. I think guilt is a really bad motivation because then you feel guilty for a bit, right? But you get used to the feeling, so eh, it's okay. Or you change things when somebody looks over your shoulder and then... Mm. It doesn't really change anything deep, I think. But if love is our motivation, learning to love nature, then I think it changes the heart. And so for me, lifestyle choices that I slowly change, it doesn't feel hard. I don't feel like I'm giving anything yeah. up. It's like an adventure. It's like, wow, I'm learning something new. And oh, I can also change that. And once something worked, it's really fun and exciting. And I yeah, can make yeah. a choice. And something goes wrong, and it's sometimes quite funny, actually. Like, <laughs> I, I had a, a wormery. I don't know if you know about wormeries, but yeah, yeah. people love, like, it's the best compost you can make, basically. And so they have these really posh ones that you can put in your flat. And I got quite excited because it looks nice, and I had this romantic idea, you know, of cooking and then throwing a bit in the wormery and we'll be <laughs> compost. And so I set it all up and I went to bed and then I woke up and man, there were worms in my whole flat. <laughs> and I found them everywhere. <laughs> it really did not go well. And so I tried it for a week every morning, picking up all the worms in my flat until I gave up and I moved them outside. And I have a beautiful wormery now. Very good. <laughs> it didn't work, but it was still fun and it's like for me it's it's an adventure to just learn yeah. how to do things differently how to make better choices i guess and it's not about um telling people to do things better but just enjoying the journey myself and inviting yeah. people to do it with me i guess i love it because it makes it it makes it feel almost more like play doesn't it than um some sort of really grueling exhausting work and um yeah, I, I was just sort of reflecting on the fact that, you know, often when you get these sort of messages like, you know, we need to consume less, that's that feels like quite a sort of a negative um, message that again sort of induces that sort of guilt. Whereas I'd know the idea of actually, have you thought that you could share this with somebody else? And that means the two of you only need one of these things. That becomes like this point of actually kind of exciting opportunities for new relationships. And yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love I love that. So that um that sort of idea of treating it like adventure. And um, opportunities. I guess one of the things I find really inspiring about you, uh, you Reggie, in terms of the various things I hear you're involved in, um, there's this there's this kind of infectious joy and um, and playfulness that comes through it. And yet, they also make genuine differences. And it, it, you know, these sorts of things do help us gradually move our lives into ways in which we're being more sustainable, more responsible, more loving. So um, I find that really inspiring. How do you think as um, so you know as a church community how might people go about doing that both on their sort of you know as individuals in their own homes within our sort of church community settings and you know wanting to bring about wider change in our in our communities do you have any sort of i don't know thoughts or ideas or good stories from the partners you work with that that demonstrate great ways of doing this sort of playful playful good work <laughs> <laughs> um I think 
I have thought about that quite a while already because I think it's something you talk about quite often when you just share with people what you're doing. Mm. And I think for me, this journey, I call it um, plotting for nature. Mm -hmm. And and so plot, um, every letter stands for something because that's an easy way for me to remember. It's a journey that I keep doing. So I always start again with a new plot, I suppose. And so P for me is stands for prayer. So Mm -hmm. I really... I think it's always good to start with prayer, but for me also, especially with this topic, just spending time with God outside, like going for Mm. a walk and just sitting somewhere under a favorite tree or something. And I just love to sit there and ask God, how, what was it meant to be like? How did you create Mm. this? What do you see here? What do you hear here? And so I just ask him, okay, what is it? What can I do? in hand with you what can we work on and so the starting point for me is really just spending time with god outside praying Mm. and then the next one um l stands for lifestyle Mm -hmm. so that's again not about say thinking okay what do i what do i have to improve or whatever but literally just observing okay what do i do every day what do i use all the time Mm. and just observing and figuring out, okay, what is my lifestyle like? What what am I doing and where could I improve something? And then from there on, go to O, which I call own it. So take responsibility for it myself. So if I, I don't know, I want to change um, where I buy my milk, I'll find uh, maybe an organization organization or a company that sells it in glass bottles or whatever or how I travel can I walk more can I use a bicycle Mm. so just um, taking some elements of this lifestyle and owning the responsibility for it taking responsibility making a choice myself because I think often we like blaming the government and whatever big corporations but I can't do anything about that but I can Mm. do about what I do in my own life or as a church what we do we can actually make a decision and change Mm. it take responsibility for it and it can be a very tiny one because I for me it really encourages me when I change something small and it works then I get really excited I get excited easily to be honest (laughs) (laughs) I I can tell (laughs) and then I want to do another one because it worked so why not do something new and then the last one is um, T. Um, yeah, S would probably be nicer, but plosh doesn't sound so nice. So <laughs> T is for um, talking or teaching. And so talking with people, taking people on the journey with us, mm. um, teaching, learning from each other. And again, it's a lot about listening, not just talking, actually. Mm. But um it's just this community element so if i learn something share about it and Mm. see okay but what are your ideas can we do something else can we improve it and so it's Mm. learning from each other and then it always goes back because um it kind of it's like a circle it's it's Mm. and then you go out and and have a chat with god again in nature and find out okay what's next what else can i do that's so, so helpful. So, so what was it? it? Was prayer, learning? What was the O? I've forgotten the O. Prayer, lifestyle, own it, and teach it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> really helpful. Oh, wonderful! I I love that. And um, uh, I mean, I I would I think within our church setting at the moment, we're trying to do quite a lot of reflecting around how we sort of create some opportunities for that sort of community, um, community learning and 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 sharing and talking, um. And also sort of engaging that with others who are outside and and beyond sort of the the church community, those who don't normally come on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'd I'd love to know, do you have any sort of advice about how, um, you know, maybe as Christians, as churches, what might our unique role, our opportunities be in engaging with those who are sort of beyond the church at the moment? Uh, Do you think there's something particular that we bring to those conversations or particular opportunities we have or any any sort of advice or wisdom um, around that sort of that engagement with others in our in our society, in our cities and our communities who are also, you know, worried about the environment and wanting to respond well. 
Does that make sense? I don't know if that was a very clear question at all. So let, me try, <laughs> let me try to say, to answer, and then if I'm completely <laughs> wrong, you can start again. Um, <laughs> so I think actually Hazelnut Community Farm, like uh, what you were part of as well, for me, they do that really well. I think it would be really fun as a church to decide, okay, one Sunday a month, we're not doing it in our building. We're not doing it the traditional um style of what happens on a Sunday morning but actually let's go out on the land let's go out where the community is let's let's mm. worship and do stuff within the community because I think a lot of people they might not naturally walk into a church building it might might never cross their mind even because it's just not part of their life but why not go out and grow some food together and do things practically on the land because I think the best space for me to have a conversation with someone is while I'm doing something it's less mm. intense it's not like it's not preachy it's not um, in the face but when you are planting things you can't just share okay why do I do this why do I care about nature and also enjoying a meal outside? Mm. Not sure if Hazelnut does that, but there's um, another um, community garden. They, on a Sunday, they grow stuff with their community in allotments and then also harvest and eat together. And oh. so it's just really spending a Sunday differently, doing church differently in a new way, get creative and create spaces that just invites people and makes people curious. And mm. I think curios curiosity is usually a very nice motivation to get connected mm. and, and just spark conversations. Yeah, I remember actually when, one of the things I was always really struck with at Hazelnut was how we'd have people who maybe they had once been involved in church or maybe they'd never been involved in church, but they the thing which would draw them was the sort of the, the activities and the outdoor and the gardening sort of stuff we'd do and um we'd often uh start by you know a bit of social and chatting and then people would be getting stuck in on jobs and you'd be yeah. knelt down weeding alongside someone you've never met before but because you're there for 20 minutes weeding um you know you end up chatting and, and yeah. finding out a little bit about them um and then one of the things i loved actually which you did at hell's no it was very it was very sort of non-confrontational but also just kind of just quite sort of openly you know, honest about our faith and the fact that we were a worshiping community. Um, the the sort of the those who were part of the worshiping community would gather and we would just pray uh, a simple sort of spoken office in the garden. And sometimes people who were who weren't really Christians who'd, who sort of came along being like, oh no, I'm not into that part. Um, you know, you'd see them at the edges as they're continuing to garden, just listening in, and gradually that you know some of them would actually come and join in. Um, uh, and and I think I think there is that sort of. As you mentioned earlier, there's something quite profound often about being in nature and sort of noticing um, the incredible beauty and complexity of um, of our environment, of our of our natural world. Which I think it does inspire something within many people who wouldn't necessarily call themselves people of faith or Christians. Um, yeah. And and so to sort of just come along people within that sort of space mm -hmm. is yeah is is quite is quite powerful. I always think of them. Um, I, I love being in forests because I, I I love when you kind of look up and you see the amazing canopies. It reminds me of almost a bit like when you're in a cathedral and you're sort of made to look up and just go, wow. Um, actually, we've got, you know, loads of natural cathedrals already. Yeah, around, yeah, exactly. which, yeah. which people are really going into and, and, and love. So um, uh, wonderful. Uh, I mean, uh, Reggie, I've loved like all of this, um, all the areas we sort of covered. I don't know if you've got any other um, final things, any 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 you know deep wisdom or, or good stories or anything like that which um which you wanted to share with us this morning uh, or this afternoon wherever someone's listening <laughs> <laughs> i think i would just love to encourage people to um walk back into the garden like mm. i think we started off in a garden didn't we and got mm. sat with adam and eve and chilled in the shade of the trees and and i think let's just walk back into the garden find our journey back and find our space to just enjoy nature and learn to love it again. And yeah. from that on, I think things will just happen because once you start loving something, you will get curious and want to know more about it, want to learn how to care for it and um, what we don't know, we won't care for. 
And what we don't love, we won't really want to know a lot about it, I think. Mm. So let's walk back into the garden and, and learn to fall in love with all of creation again. That is, yeah, the natural beauty around us. That is people, that's our neighbors. Just be in the garden together. And yeah. I think then we can we can still make a huge difference. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. And again, rooting it all back to, um, you know, that call to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength to love your neighbor as yourself, really centering around that. Um, just that central part of the, of the gospel that is love. I think that's, that's really beautiful. Thank you, um, Reggie, so much. Thank you for all you've shared. Um, I, all the best with, you know, the goats and the chickens and the food forest <laughs> and, um, you know, the traveling around to visit all these partners and actions. Um, can you just remind us of the Russia UK website and, um, uh, and the different ways that people might benefit from engaging with Russia before we finish? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So you can just go online, find Arosha UK, um, dot org, and then there's a, a little thingy where it says what we do, and which is where you can find the Eco Church website. So you can sign up your church for it and go on the journey. Um, or sign up for Wild Christian, and then you will get really inspirational emails with stories of um, what things people are doing. So really encouragements about what's happening across the UK, but also inspirations, what you can do in your personal life. And yeah, there's there's quite a lot of different things on the website. So just have a browse. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Reggie. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good talking to you. Wonderful. So I guess we're back in the studio. Is that how we say it? It feels <laughs> grand because we're recording this in a church. But, um, you know, when are you going to get some goats then, uh, that, Grace? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, don't. I don't. <laughs> I think Tom would have us get a donkey maybe rather than goats. But I think donkeys oh, yeah. maybe aren't as useful. I'm well, sure. yeah, apparently, apparently there's loads of donkeys around because people don't like killing donkeys. Um, people but then, like killing goats? Well, maybe I no, no, I, I, maybe I shouldn't go on the podcast. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so what, what did you think of what did you think of the interview? What did you think of um, some of what Regina was saying? Anything stand out to you? Oh, I, she's brilliant. I I love listening to her. I could listen to her talk about her living this lifestyle and mm. and living out all of this in practice for ages. Like she had so many. Um, funny stories mm. about like the worms and the compost party <laughs> and she almost made me think I could do a compost party or not was it, it wasn't compost was it it was yeah. a yeah it was like was sorting compost? the, comp yeah, yeah, the compost yeah. I'll come to your compost party okay. that sounds fun <laughs> I'll send you the dates that would be great um but yeah there's just what she was saying about doing hard things and mm. a lot of this stuff is quite hard when we we can romanticize it yeah. you know having goats and all of that and uh, you know growing our own food and it can seem really idyllic maybe but mm. it's hard work mm. and um what she said about it's easier when you do that in community and can be fun when you do that in community i thought was a really good point and how many of us have that kind of community around us to to do that and make those things easy i mm. wondered if you know, what what your thoughts are on that do you have a community like that lee well yeah so it's interesting i mean um I, so i'm i'm exploring moving to a community which is an eco community where mm. that sort of stuff almost becomes so easy that it's, it's you know it's not it's not particularly noble like the efforts <laughs> you're making because that's just the life which the community develops mm. um i think it's way harder when you're living in you know an urban or a suburban or a village setting um with your own house with your own family or housemates or on your own um because you you, you know when you need something you kind of need it and therefore most of the times you, you know you have you have your own hoover and your own lawnmower and your and everything you kind of need for a self-sustained household um is pretty big so so yeah i think that question of what does what does it look like to translate some of those things which make it easier in a more intentional community setting into perhaps a slightly more regular um you know household setup that we'd have in our country is is a really significant question i think one of the things I always find um, really inspiring is when you uh, hear sort of initiatives in neighborhoods where people do do share schemes and tool schemes or mm. clothes swaps or um, at, at things where we are sharing resources just immediately cut down the amount of consumption we're doing. And often in ways which, I don't know, feel quite good. If you can get a whole new wardrobe without having to spend a fortune on it, 
with clothes which are pretty much you know brand new anyway mm. um that doesn't feel like the sort of the costly side of like reducing consumption and sacrifice and things like that which 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 we kind of do as a whole need to be moving towards a reduction in in what we're consuming that i mean that's one of the immediate things that comes to mind i mean what about what about you have you been thinking about this in in, in your stewardship course is it, have you explored any of this sort of stuff within that setting yeah we, we always try and put the theory into practice and that mm. like you say that that reducing what we're consuming and um reusing things as mm. well and fixing things where we can i've um there's a few that have popped up around herefordshire uh, where we're based mm. um and i'm sure there are across the country as well there's a few um sort of repair cafes mm. you've seen these where if you've got something a lamp that's broken and you don't know how to fix it yourself you don't just throw it away you take it here and somebody there might have the skills to fix it and i think in a community like regina's living in maybe you would be more aware of people's skills and you know oh this person's good at sewing and mm. i need my jeans fixed i'll take them to her or to him um whereas maybe living in a more conventional setup we wouldn't know if mm. your neighbor's good at a particular thing so these kinds of repair cafes, fixing things and getting into that mindset of extending the life of things instead of, oh, mm. it's looking a bit shabby now, I'll throw it away, um, is really good. And like you were saying about sort of clothes swaps, mm. made me think about as, as churches, we are kind of communities as mm. well as the communities we live in. We have a community of church and there's things that we can do. I'm thinking of sort of families with young children you know children mm. particularly babies grow out of clothes so quickly and you'll have a whole load of clothes that are fairly brand new that could just be passed on to the next person who has a baby that age and and as churches is that something we could do could we have a bag of clothes for this mm. age of a baby and then someone has a child you give them that they pass it on to the next person it cycles round. um but it's the creativity that it takes i think to come up with things like that is the difficult thing for me yeah and probably like the, I, I wonder if it's also the, the initiative because it requires mm. people to get it off the ground doesn't it and to carry yeah. it and often that you know that wouldn't necessarily be a a huge thing to do but people are sort of waiting for permission or waiting mm. for somebody else to do it or worried about being bogged down to do that for the next 15 years and never being able to escape yeah. it um but but i wonder if that's actually where um you know if, if each of us are stepping up and even if it's even if actually some of those schemes only run for a season that's like a season of mm. of sharing and reducing you know some waste which is, is, a, is a start isn't it and that, yeah that was the things i found quite inspiring in um the way regina talks is actually she kind of has that starting small and starting with what you can do and building from there um and, and like you're saying recognizing um the places where community does exist and, and across generations and i think that's mm. something churches do have a really strong potential to to offer because you know when i come to church on a sunday morning here i've got people who are of um, all different generations around me i've got some younger people who um are more up to date on like what the upcoming tech is or like things which actually could help you know change stuff but i've also got um you know people who lived through the war where everything was repaired and nothing was wasted and actually are carrying this this ethos we need to regain today having slipped into much more of a sort of an instant consumption throwaway culture mm. um so yeah i know i think that's totally cute and when you and you're talking about finding places where people can almost share their skills and their wisdom um and actually uh, yeah i wonder if, if if helping our churches to be places of almost shared learning um mm. and, and being able to almost serve each other with our particular gifts that could be really interesting it probably happens already without even you know without us necessarily knowing about what's bubbling under the surface but ways to bring that bubbling a bit more to the surface um, make it more visible make it more visible yeah, yeah. that's a much better way of saying it um well i think what yeah. you're doing through the eco hub here at spsj i think is a really good example of that um that sort of learning mm. i think sort of making visible care for the planet and the things the skills that we need you know growing our own food and seeing mm. how you do that and what it looks like and and sharing that food with people mm. i was wondering if you could share a little bit about the eco hub here yeah yeah so um yeah so we uh, a few of us um about just over a year ago had um been thinking it'd be good to 
do something with this bit of grass that was right by the school gate on the school on the churchyard um which it was used for occasional things but but not used a lot of the time um and since it's right by the school gate where everyone gathers anyway twice a day to drop off their kids and pick up their kids um it just seemed like a natural gathering point for community um so really what we've done is i mean it's so it, i feel like eco hub makes it sound far grander than it is we've put some raised beds in we have planted up some veg um we tried to do a few workshops and a few gatherings and we're doing some regular meetups for people who um are interested in gardening or want to learn how to garden um sort of after school drop-ins with just very short sessions with sort of eco e activities of various kinds um, and really, just sort of like not really huge plans of knowing where it can go, but hoping that, you know, like, like a garden, it might organically grow and develop in different ways and become, I don't know, just continue to, almost, continue to allow that community space to, to, to sort of spring forth in different ways that we might not plan for at the moment as, as different people come with their skills and passions. Um, yeah, I, th I think for me, uh, you know, uh, the reason it's sort of quite gardening focused is because that's been something I could have caught the bug for a few years ago. Um, and I just think, you know, growing your ve own veg is actually quite straightforward. I started it when I lived in a flat, so I didn't even have a garden. I was like that crazy person where you see their balcony is overflowing <laughs> with plants. And I did things like planting broccoli, not realizing how massive it gets and <laughs> not, not designed for a balcony. Um, but actually, to be able to do something where you end up with like zero miles on your food you have the fun of picking it and eating things i probably wouldn't eat otherwise um it there's something quite it inspires a kind of an awe and a wonder in you which which again reminded me of when regina was talking about reconnecting with the sort of the wonderment in nature mm. in nature and and finding god and falling in love with god through just the beauty of his creation um and for me you know being outdoors being in the garden i think it does that i feel i do feel quite close to god um in that process so um for me i'm hoping that as as you know as the opportunities continue to develop here and other people step into the you know step in to try things out using that space um that actually other people might catch some of that sense of wonder which which will bring about that kind of internal conversion that we need um to respond to climate stuff because I, I think often even within me i can sense a level of sort of ambivalence of um you know feeling like it's also overwhelmingly big that i don't know what to do and therefore i kind of you know i, I just don't do anything um but actually things which just help us have that kind of conversion where we fall in love with nature then suddenly our responses don't feel costly and like a chore and another thing to do and something to feel guilty about they become a source of kind of life and, and energy and fun for us mm. um well, she said something similar didn't she that in her job she has to take in all the sort of negative news stories mm. all the all the the science behind climate change and all the the tragedy of it and that can be mm. quite a heavy burden um but she was talking about how not to let that sort of drag you down because it can yeah. just feel overwhelming and like how how can little old me do anything or even yeah. our little community do anything to make a change um and equally you can maybe feel guilty about the things you aren't doing yet mm because there's so much that we can be doing and not everyone can do everything. It depends so much on your context and your, your circumstances. Mm. But I think just not feeling guilty of, you know, you can't get rid of that second car mm. or your car, leave that for now, you know, work on something else. You know, I think trying to decide on the bits we can change um, without feeling too overwhelmed and too bogged down with things is really helpful, which is where working in community helps, yeah. isn't it? Because we can, share each other's burdens in that uh, yeah, sometimes. I, I love the, the, the plot um, sort of memory uh, sort of tool mm. sheets. You talked about that prayer of, you know, going out, engaging, find that wonderment of lifestyle, just observing what's, what's happening in your life already and then owning that and taking responsibility for small areas mm. before then talking and teaching and sharing with each other that you can sort of do that together. I found that um, particularly helpful. As, as, you, as you're talking about that, I was... Um, I was thinking a little bit about almost that kind of existential dread that so often accompanies, yeah. you know, all the news around this, even, even some of the, you know, activist movements like Extinction Rebellion, like the whole idea is it's this sort of extinction focus, is this quite sort of fatalistic, mm. it's too late, nothing can change. Um, 
do you think do you think sort of theologically as the church as the gospel there's there is like a hopeful message we can put or is that is that sort of a form of climate denial and burying our heads in the sand? I don't know. Do you have any... What do you think? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways of looking at that. I think we, as Christians, we have to be hopeful. Mm. That's just what we're called to do. But what we place that hope in is maybe the question. And some Christians would say, well, the Bible tells me that, that how the end of time will be. And so humanity is not going to get wiped out because... The Bible tells me it won't. Mm. Um, and that attitude can then sometimes lead to a let's not bother caring for the planet mm. type approach. Um, there's a theologian who I love called Tim Gorringe, and he has written a book called The World Made Otherwise, and it's all about environmental stuff. It's quite heavy going. It's quite dense mm. stuff. Um, but one of his main ideas I find very hopeful, and he sort of says... As a species, we're not going to be wiped out. We don't have to really be worrying about that. But there are going to be, you know, if things go the way they do, there are going to be huge changes to society in the way that our species does things. Necessary changes, because, you know, we can't just keep flying around the world all the time every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And he points back to this community thing. And he says, we are going to become, or our world is going to become a lot smaller again, just like it was before. That, that the things, the people that we know, the places that we go, the way we get our food will become a lot more localized because it has to. Um, and so he's part of, or, or he's um, done a lot of work with something called the Transition Towns Movement. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, I don't think so, no. It's basically a community or a town signs up to this and says, we are going to try and make it so that our community can be more localized and can do things easier so it's easier to get local food Mm. it's easier to walk places in our area you know and and just saying we recognize this is the way that we probably have to go with this so let's try and work on that now and make that easier Mm. um which i think is quite a hopeful way of looking at things and so you know what regina was talking about is already very hopeful um but the other thing is maybe more theological Mm -hmm. in that I have been doing a bit of research recently into this idea um, that we see in Romans 8, 19 to 23, about how this idea that creation is groaning Mm -hmm. and that the liberation of creation is tied in directly with the salvation and liberation of the children of God. Okay. And how uh, if, if if we're Christian and we believe ourselves to be saved that there is a responsibility directly tied in with that to liberate the rest of creation. Mm. Um, And I think if we can tap into that, then I think there's a great deal of hope in that. Because that that way the Bible's saying to us, not that the earth's going to be burnt up one day and we don't have to worry about it, but saying that our salvation and God's plan for salvation includes the Mm. rest of creation. And I find that very hopeful. Yeah, what was coming to mind you were speaking was, um, you know, that line from the Lord's Prayer, like, your kingdom come, you'll be done here on earth as in heaven. Mm. And, you know, that vision of the new heavens and the, the new earth, that hope, not being the excuse of just saying, we don't have to care about it now. Actually, you know, how do we as the church bring about that new creation through, through our life and work mm. here, through the power of the Spirit? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. That's really inspiring. That was, that was probably my h- biggest highlight from... Regina's interview was the way that um, I mean it took me by surprise when she sort of said oh there's a verse which always comes to mind and I said you know it'd be like you know one of those verses to do with creation (laughs) but when she said the one which really for her connects it is that that when Jesus is asked what are the greatest commandments he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself just the tying of that very basic um, gospel vision for for living and for the world into our understanding of the environment, I thought was really helpful because we can sometimes separate them, I think. I was also reminded, um, uh, I mentioned the Sustaining Church Conference I was involved in, and last year we had a speaker, Deborah Reinstra, um, who, uh, she's, she's amazing. She does sort of um, English literature um, stuff through to feminism, through to eco-theology, all sorts of um, fascinating stuff. But she gave this incredible um talk at the the conference and it's on youtube so if you want to see it go to hazelnut community farm um on youtube and and you can watch it uh but she talks about this image of refugia 
which is where after you've had sort of a um, a big sort of catastrophic catastrophic event in a in an environment so after a um, volcanic eruption or a forest fire um, that there are these little pockets of refugia of sort of refuge where biodiversity survives and where it sort of spreads back out from um, and she connected this with the the image of the church and actually part of our role as the church is is that we are almost little pockets of the kingdom to spread back out and that that carries through you know on the environmental level just as it does on that on on i guess that more mm. liberation of creation um dimension you're saying so yeah i think that's really really helpful how, how have you found people have responded as you have you been engaging with this because you said you're teaching on this um mm. you know what's what sort of most transformed you in the process of doing that has, has there been something that um that has just made you kind of go wow um or that your students have responded to yeah i think i think that particular lesson is the most transformative mm. because um particularly the the students i teach they do have a quite a strong theology of the world is going to be completely replaced at the end Mm. of time so why worry um and so we look into that we look into how the idea of a new heaven and a new earth is similar to being made a new creation in christ and Mm. you know we don't get completely replaced when we are a new creation neither will the earth is is my belief um but it is i think it is transformative for my students and for me to think that it's not choosing between saving souls or saving the planet yeah that that is all tied in together and that god cares as much for non-human creation as for human creation Mm. which is a big thing for people to recognize because christianity is quite i'm going to use the word anthropocentric so human focused Mm. um and we have been for a very long time and i think we're beginning to explore how to balance that out a little bit um, but just seeing that God has a relationship with non-human creation, mm. we see that in Psalms, we see that in Job. Um, there's just these brilliant occasions where there's God on a mountain with mountain goats while they're giving birth. There's no humans around. Mm. <laughs> you know? That is part of their relationship. Um, and I think for me, that's been quite transformative to see a little bit more of the intrinsic worth in nature, not what can nature do for me, yeah but what what is the worth in nature that i don't even i'm not even part of Mm. um for example when we moved to hereford we inherited this brilliant garden which the lady who lived in our house before us planted with all kinds of i still haven't identified everything in our garden i'm slowly working my way through um and we've got small children and i've learned very quickly which plants in our garden are poisonous um and initially my instinct was just to rip them all out and then since then, I've thought, actually, I'm going to teach my children. Mm. I mean, they don't eat plants anyway, really, <laughs> even salad that I tried to give them. Um, I was like, well, what if I teach my children? Those aren't for you to eat. They're, you know, just, those are for the bees. Those are for yeah. the insects. I don't need to be ripping them out because there is a worth in them. There's a value in them. And I'm teaching my children something about creation mm. as well. And I think that's part of what Regina was talking about, that we can't love something that we don't know and so trying to understand it a little bit better um i think sometimes we're too quick to rip up something you know weeds and things that we think oh no that makes my lawn look messy Mm. but actually it's really important like you uh, i I can't remember if we recorded it or if it was before talking about no mo may about letting your lawns grow wild and how some people don't like it because it looks messy but actually it's doing something that's not about us it's not mm. about us having a nice looking garden it's i mean it, i think it does look nice but uh, you know it that's that's part of the relationship almost between god and non-human creation mm. that we can help facilitate in some ways um yeah yeah it, stri- it strikes me with both that and with you know our earlier discussion of community and the role of community one of, sort of in both of those there's this element of almost beginning to understand ourselves again as being within an a bigger ecosystem of God's creation in in a way that we are you know we are a beautiful part of his creation we're a very good part um, if we like follow the genesis sort of creation accounts but there's also six other days of like incredible creations that are good mm-hmm. um and uh, and you know even in community there is that sense that we are um 
we are not the sole things that matter and everything is about serving us. Actually, we receive and we benefit from other parts of the ecosystem and then we actually provide you know and sustain other parts sort of through that and I, I love that sort of I don't know as you're speaking that was really coming to mind in terms of both how we respond sort of practically within creation and within our lifestyles thinking actually creation isn't just here for me to exploit um, and there's parts which which I benefit from even if it's not directly um, but actually also then integrating that into our our communities in our neighborhoods or our villages or our churches um to think about that way actually also strikes me as being a very new testament image of of sort of the body of christ you know part saying you know just because i'm an eye doesn't mean i don't need the hand um i i wonder if that yeah that can sort of that can tie in somewhat absolutely Um, and we, we can spend more time in the old testament sometimes when we're thinking about the environment but Mm. it struck me when she was talking about or you asked her the question even um what is the church's unique role um in engaging non-church communities and she talked about spending time like once a month outside Mm. with communities and doing things and how it's easier to talk to people when you're doing things absolutely true um i find that very inspiring but I was thinking to myself, how often in the New Testament is Jesus outside? Yeah. Teaching, preaching, healing, just talking to people. I haven't gone and done the, <laughs> the, the, the worked it out, but I imagine it's more often than not mm. he was outside. And his parables, all well, not all, but, but a lot of them talk about natural imagery, agriculture, which in mm. Herefordshire really can speak to us. Um, and... I think we miss that. We say, oh, Jesus never talked about the environment. So, well, there wasn't a crisis when Jesus was around, (laughs) but uh, Mm. he certainly was a a part of the environment. Mm. You know, nature was part of of his life and his teaching, and and we don't have to look too far to find that. Um, So that idea about as churches, we've become very indoor. (laughs) Maybe that's just in the UK because it's quite cold, but, you know, we've got nice weather at the moment. We can go out a bit more, put some coats on maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's so true, isn't it? I mean, even if he didn't talk about climate emergency, clearly the fact that he uses sort of agrarian and horticultural and naturey themes in his parables so much, there's something about creation which can mirror the gospel, that can mirror that 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 yeah that message that mm-hmm. he was he was communicating. I it, I just think you know I, I feel like we've almost cycled around to where um, Regina ended, so may, maybe it's a good place for us to bring a stop. Is that almost that stepping back out into the garden um, and, and entering again into you know falling in love with the creation as, as God has designed it to be? Um, yeah, I think I think for me that was a, a wonderful point that she left off on, and you know maybe we should we should wrap up and we should all go out into our gardens or you know go for a walk in the woods. Um, and that might be, you know, that, that good first step of um, responding to some of this in our own lives. But yeah, absolutely. Any closing words, Grace? Or uh... no, thank you for chatting with me, Luke. Yeah, it's been, really it's fun. been a joy. Well, <laughs> thanks for listening, and we um, hope you'll be able to join us for uh, future episodes. Um, yeah, have a have a have a good week, and go out and do a walk somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope this episode has got you thinking. And please share this conversation with someone as we continue to learn and grow together. We look forward to you joining us again next time.